Hello, this is Curious Youth from MathWorks. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate clock recovery for high-speed serial data transmission systems. Uh, this is a wired communication system. It is baseband in nature. There's no carriers involved and there's no IQ signaling. We're simply sending ones and zeros uh, baseband style from the transmitter through the receiver uh, over a wired interface. The central problem we're trying to address here is one of mismatched clocks. That's our focus in this video. So uh, to do that, we have to do sort of two things here. One is we have to be able to model different clock domains in the model. The transmitter is going to have its clock domain. The receiver is going to have its clock domain. And we want to know what impact that will have if left uncorrected, having those two different clocks uh, unsynchronized. And then second, we want to be able to implement a scheme to correct for the mismatch clocks. And here, what we mean by that is we want the receiver to be able to adapt its clock over here on the right to the transmitter's clock over here on the left. So the transmitter we assume here just sort of transmits at will. It's blind with regard to the receiver. It sends data uh, at its own rate without any knowledge of the, the, how the receiver is doing with that data. Now, there is no uh, what's called a back channel from the RX back to the TX telling the TX, let's say, to uh, throttle, a speed up, slow down, or do something else. Now, again, the transmitter's clock will never be perfectly synchronized with the receiver's clock. Here we're showing two different rates at 2.501 gigabits per second and at 2.5 gigabits per second. They're off in this case by one megabit per second, but it could be any number and that number could change uh, over time. So to model the different clock domains in Simulink, we use a combination of voltage controlled oscillators to generate different clock rates and triggered subsystems. OK, and so those two things together are very flexible in Simulink when it comes to modeling different clock domains. And then on the receive side, we use a particular PLL architecture to recover uh, the transmitted clock uh, from the RX data here. Now, on the model itself, what you see here, it is a very slimmed down model of an actual 30 system. It's a very slimmed down 30s model. Um, this was done really just to focus on the main topic of the video, which is clock rate mismatch. Uh, for example, we're not modeling uh, all the different types of uh, noise you would see in a system. We're not modeling jitter and crosstalk. Uh, we really just have two impairments here. We've got the inner symbol interference introduced by the backplane model or analog channel. And then we have the clock rate mismatch between the transmitter and the receiver. So, and because we're not modeling all those extra impairments, we're also not including uh, the various fixes for those impairments. We're not modeling FFEs and DFEs and CTLEs. We're not modeling automatic gain control and saturating amplifiers. All of that is really omitted from this model. So in this case, the receiver uh, is the CDR and the CDR is the receiver. So it's pretty slim down and easy to follow and understand what the model is doing. So let's start with a walkthrough of the model. Uh, this will be more of a high level, system level walkthrough. In a follow-on video, I, I want to get more into the details and the how of the video, but I also want to keep the time manageable in these videos, so we're going to have to break it into parts. So let's start over here on the left on the transmit side. Again, we've got this constant block uh, that just says clock error. This is a MATLAB variable, uh, which is, in this case, it's set to a value of 1 uh, E6, so 1 megabit per second. Uh, that comes in and drives our VCO. Uh, which in turn, that leads to the 2.501 uh, gigahertz sinusoidal output. So this is, again, as a sinusoidal output of this VCO. And again, if you look at the free running rate, it would be 2.5, but we add in that 1 megabits per second, and then you end up with 2.501 for the output. We threshold that uh, sinusoidal output to form a square wave, something more like a clock. And that 2.501 gigahertz clock drives our bit generation process uh, using a positive edge triggered subsystem. If we look underneath that block, we've got a Bernoulli binary uh, data generator generates ones and zeros with a Bernoulli distribution. And then we center those zeros and ones around zero volts uh, via this uh, minus 0.5 uh, operator. All right, so that data plus and minus zero uh, plus and minus 0.5 volts, that's our data stream, that feeds our backplane model, our analog channel. That um, we see here how it's built. It's built out of a set of seven 
uh, by quad or second order IR filters, all executed in parallel, summed, and then delayed to form the output of the analog channel. Now here you see on the right it's uh, magnitude response. So you see it's general low pass characteristic. Since in this case we're sending data at around um, uh, 2.5 gigabits per second, or um, you know that corresponds to about half that rate of hertz. We see that's one gigahertz. There's two gigahertz. We see how much attenuation is around those particular frequencies. It's you know right around 10 dB or so. Okay, so the output of the backplane model now feeds really the main topic of interest, which is the receiver and uh, how do we recover uh, clock from data. So the data comes in to our clock recovery PLL and we see uh, this, our PLL. Uh, the first thing we do with that data is we threshold it. So we essentially convert that analog waveform to a, I'll call it the poor man's clock. So it's not a, it's not a, uh, 50% duty cycle, perfectly periodic signal. It's, it's going to, shall we say, uh, come and go as the data comes and goes, the clock. But we're going to use that, shall we say, poor man's clock to sample the output of the VCO, which is a sinusoidal waveform. And then depending on where we're sampling it, are we sampling it too early or too late? Um, then that will generate a corresponding positive or negative voltage, which is going to direct the VCO to speed up or slow down to match up with the receive uh, data rate. So, and that clock that we generate, the output of the VCO, we threshold it again, just as we did in the transmit side to form the recovered clock. That recovered clock will then serve, you don't see it in this subsystem, serve to sample the data again. So we kind of come full circle or cycle in this uh, subsystem where we start out with data that becomes a clock which is used to create another recovered clock, which samples that data again. So again, it goes kind of a full 360 here. Uh, and you see that on the output side. We, when, we, when we see the recovered clock on the output side, it samples the input data to the RX on positive going edges. And that again is our, therefore, our recovered data there on the output. So let's go ahead and run this model and we'll kind of just look at some waveforms and try to get a better understanding of what it's doing, how it does it, how it runs. Um, and then again, in a follow up video, I want to cover some more of the how in, in more detail, but I want to keep the time manageable here. So here we see the received uh, eye diagram after synchronization, and it's a pretty steady eye. We see two uh, UI or two unit intervals or two bits worth of um, persistent eye data. And if we uh, go underneath the clock recovery PLL, I've got a number of probe points where I have just probed off, uh, you know, here the thresholded clock, the phase detector output, the VCO input, VCO output, the recovered clock, and I put those all on a scope over here. Uh, and the particular waveform I want to concentrate on right now is the VCO input and the receiver. If we look at it, uh, we see that when it's turned on uh, and started to adapt, uh, it has a lot of undershoot and overshoot and oscillated around quite a bit before settling down and kind of oscillating in a much smaller way around some steady state voltage around 0 0.4 millivolts. And if you were to do the math and go under um, the VCO block and look at its uh, free running frequency and its gain, you could do some simple algebra, multiply the sensitivity times 0 0.4 millivolts, add the quiescent rate to it. Again, this is the 2.5 gigabits uh, per second number. And we could compute, uh, that would com come out to be about 2.501 gigabits a second. So again, that would be the transmitted data rate. So again, we're, we're blocked in quite nicely. In fact, we can just go over to MATLAB and do that real quick. We'll see that if we take, uh, just clear this out, if we take zero, we take 0.4 millivolts, times 2.5 E9, that's the gain, plus 2.5 E9, the free running frequency, we get our 2.501 um, gigahertz clock recovery. And you can see we also recovered, or we determined what that clock rate was a different way. We looked at the time between successive zero crossings using this period measurement subsystem. And then we convert the period to frequency by an inversion, and we come up with the rate that way. Likewise, there's many ways to come up with that measurement. You could also look at the spectrum. 
of the uh, recovered clock and deduce from where the main bang is in the spectrum uh, what that clock frequency is as well. So there's many ways to measure that frequency here in the tools. Um, that is most of what I wanted to cover. Um, you know, I could cover a few more probe points in the model or analog, let's see, our channel input, output uh, looks like this. If I zoom in on so many uh, bits worth Y, the input uh, to the uh, backplane model analog channel is, of course, the ideal ones and zeros. And then you see the uh, effect of the uh, analog channel, the low pass effect, finite rise and fall time and attenuation uh, there in blue. OK, um, and then again, in a follow up video, I want to kind of drill down through all these other um, waveforms that we could analyze. I've got a quick snapshot of them here, and then we'll kind of step through that and get a much better idea of how this PLL works and how you can tune it and so on. OK, I hope that served as a good uh, starting point, a good overview. And then um, again, please join me back later when we uh, step through the PLL and how it works in more detail. Thank you.